I don't need to be. Hey guys, Ryan Young, Kama Jiu Jitsu. And I wanted to do a video like with uh, with the other instructors we have. We got two more instructors here in our uh, Texas campus. We've got Mike on the left and we've got Ken on the right. And they teach our, our day classes that are run by the junior instructors. And I kind of wanted to get you knowing them a little bit. So uh, let's kind of start off with Ken on the right. He's been with us a little bit longer. He's been with us since uh, summer of 2014. And he teaches our Wednesday, uh, Friday morning and Saturday morning classes. Ken, why don't you kind of tell us how you got involved in jiu-jitsu? All right, so we moved to Texas, uh, I want to say about three and a half, four years ago. And our son was doing, uh, our oldest son was doing martial arts in, uh, in Florida where we were living. And it wasn't jiu-jitsu or anything like that. So we were looking for a martial arts studio here for him. And we had an excellent instructor in, in Florida, so we were looking for somebody who's very much like him. Uh, we ended up going to a uh, like Taekwondo karate place, and the instructor there just simply was not a somebody who should be instructing children. And so we kept looking, and then I think through Facebook or something like that, uh, my wife uh, ended up getting in touch with Ryan through someone, and uh, so I brought him out to a class when we were uh, at another studio. And, uh, you know, brought my son there. The whole goal was just to have my son do jujitsu. And I saw the way Ryan taught. And I'm like, that is an excellent teacher. And that's somebody I want to learn from. And so I decided I couldn't have my son growing up and knowing jujitsu and me not knowing jujitsu. So by the time you get 15, 16, 17 years old, I can't have somebody who could choke me out in the house without being able to defend myself. So I made sure I joined right alongside of him. <laughs> And uh, Mike, how did you get started in jiu-jitsu? So, <clears throat> my story is a little bit different. I didn't go, well, I was actually looking at Taekwondo as well. Or uh, looking at, my, my son was taking Taekwondo and I was talking to his instructor. And I was asking his instructor if the adult class was somewhere, I was kind of looking for a place to take my older son and maybe get in shape. And I went up to him and I said, hey, I'm thinking about trying your adult class. What do you think? You think we can stop by tonight? He goes, no, you want to come to jujitsu. And that was it. It was that night, came, that's the first time I met Ryan, started rolling, hooked ever since. When you have a wrestling background too. Yes. So that, yeah, so that was a bit interesting. So it, it kind of fed into that background where I liked the groundwork, uh, taking people down mm -hmm. from the wrestling background. But uh, the key for me when I started was... And you had this great quote when I started. It's like, I don't understand why you'd want to be on your back. Right? Because in wrestling, you don't want to be on your back. Yeah. You don't want to be on your back. I said, why would you want to be on your back? Uh, that doesn't make any sense to me. The guy can hit you in the face. He goes, okay, go face down. He goes, now what are you going to do? And he starts hitting me in the back, in the back <laughs> of the head. And I was like, oh, okay. He goes, you can't do anything from your stomach. You have to be facing so you can defend yourself. So that's how I got started and uh, been hooked ever since. Yeah, your base in wrestling has been, been, been very helpful for you in your development of jiu-jitsu. Absolutely. Um, you picked it up really quickly. Ken, you picked it up quickly as well, but your background is a little different. Um, weren't you doing like Krav or? No, I did a little bit of uh, Muay Thai. Oh, okay. But, but, you know, I mean, a little bit of Muay Thai. Yeah. You know, I, I wouldn't say that I, I do Muay Thai or even fought. Um, I did some sparring with guys, um, several gyms, in one in New Jersey, a couple in Florida. And I did sparring with guys who do smokers, which is basically the local fight scene. Um, but I get tooled by those guys. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And um, <clears throat> Mikey, you had the, you have a pretty interesting story about the couple of experiences you had with a teenager that was in our school at the time. Um, <laughs> why don't you tell us about a couple of them? <laughs> yeah. So we had a teenager that was, was he 15? Uh, I think when I started. 15, 15. at the time, yeah. yeah. He was 15. And... He was probably, I don't know, how big do you think? About 5'5". Five, 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 about 45. Something like that. Yeah. About 35. Yeah, about 35. Yeah, yeah. And would just absolutely destroy me in class. Absolutely destroy me. I remember going into work, and I would lean back, and I would have bruises here, here on my chest, or red marks around my neck, and everybody's like, what's, go what's going on? And I said, so man, this guy really kicked my ass yesterday. I said, oh, wow. I said, yeah. Young kid, too. High school kid. Just go all day long. I go, whoa, he must be big if he whooped your ass. And I go, yeah, he's about this big, he's about a buck forty. And they're like, what? You let him? I go, this dude's money. I go, he just destroyed me. And that's when I realized how good jujitsu is. When somebody that is that significantly smaller than my, me 
can dominate me like that, you don't ask me a question over there. <laughs> you need to move behind the camera. That's whenever I realized uh, how good jujitsu was when I saw somebody that small just be able to dominate like they were. And there was a really funny story. I think uh, you were talking to his mom when you were training with him. Do you remember that one? <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> you can go ahead and tell that one. I think, you, uh, were you in his guard and um, his mom had come in uh, to pick him up, to take him home, and uh, I think you were kind of making fun of him, something like that. I yes. think I was mounted on him oh, and trying mounted? to play really heavy. Yeah. And she was like, take it easy on yeah. my, like, my son or something. And then, and you said something to her. <laughs> I don't remember what it was. Oh, uh, yeah, I can't remember. Yeah, and then it, it, and eventually he got, he caught you. And yeah, he got me. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, I'm just trying to teach him how to, I don't remember what it was, but whatever I did, it motivated Nick yeah. <laughs> and he I think immediately dispelled me yeah and uh, and uh, took my shoulder and I believe he held on to it a little extra long which is why the shoulder still hurts <laughs> but that's another story you know Ken's got an interesting story about uh, when a guy came in to train at our school um, what belt was he um, I think he might have been a brown belt brown and belt. And you're rolling. So why don't you go and tell them the whole story? You're you're probably six months into it as a white belt. Not even six months because I think it was around Christmas time, and I yeah. started like in August. Yeah. So I was a four month white belt at the time. It was Christmas actually. You're yeah, right. it was Christmas. It was Christmas, Christmas Day. Yeah, it's Christmas 2014. I would started maybe late August. He has it on his calendar. And no, uh, I just remember that because those dates I remember. And uh, so brown belt came in my size, right? Guy's been what doing it eight years, nine years, something I, like that. I don't at the know. Time I don't even know. And uh, rolling with him, and, and because our sort of methodology is very defensive, um, you learn defense first as a white belt. Um, you really learn to protect yourself. You learn to protect your arms. You learn not to give things up. And it leaves you in a good position to do what you want, or at least not get submitted. And I was rolling with him for a while, and I got him to the point that he was in turtle, and I was on top on turtle, sort of north-south turtle. And I reached under, because I'm a four-month white belt, didn't realize. And this brown belt guy who's been training eight years, Rather than sweeping me, rather than getting out of the turtle, you know, wrist locked me from, from underneath. And I couldn't believe it. Like, even four months in, I knew that was just, it was kind of just like a punk move. And I'm like, you, you literally gave up on everything you knew as far as escaping and rolling and reversing and mounting me or choking me, anything, arm barring me. And you went from a wrist lock from underneath on turtle. And I walked off afterwards and I talked to Ryan and I told him and I started laughing about it because I just knew in my head that that's not what... You know, a brown belt should be doing a little white belt. <laughs> and then what happened the next year? You, you The trained. next year, he couldn't tap me. I couldn't tap him, but we rolled to uh, a stalemate. And uh, so even then, it was, wasn't even to the point that he could even get that wrist lock on me or anything else. But he certainly couldn't finish me. And then... Uh, what happened the third year? The third year, uh, unfortunately, we were ro rolling five-minute rounds. So he was controlling me. Uh, for five minute rounds, I swept him. I get the cross side. I think that was the second year. Oh, the third year is the one when he he got uh, to a good position on you. And oh, and he, and he backed out. You're right. So yeah, second second year we were rolling five minute rounds. So again, this is a year and four months of jujitsu against eight or nine years brown belt, and couldn't tap me. And we're running five minute rounds. And then finally, I sweep him. And I didn't know where we were. I get the cross side, and I said, "Boom!" Now you're. I'm thinking to myself, I'm in my wheelhouse now. So I had a really good cross side game at that point. You know, Ryan not watching what was going on, goes time, and I was like, "Oh my God!" I was finally going to get an opportunity to play some offense against him, and uh, I wasn't able to. And then fast forward one more year, we rolled, and um, I was controlling him. I was dominating. He swept me finally after however minutes of rolling, and then he tapped out from on top. Meaning, then tap just said, "Okay." We're good. I'm done. Uh, once, once he got a, a, a superior position on me, and then rather than keep rolling, um, he, he saw just, the danger. He saw. He danger. just backed away. <laughs> yeah, he was. So, uh, got tired, I guess. Uh, I've, I've had that same experience with purple belts that have come in. I have a purple belt that came in with an inverted game, and uh, I had never really played against an inverted game. We don't play an inverted game, and I just went back to our basics, right? You know, my base, my stance, get my weight into him, past his his is inverted guard and then realized once I got past his guard, he was a white belt from that point on. I mean, there was, it was nothing. Like if he didn't have that inverted guard and he wasn't playing those things and, and once I was able to get past that and, and the best part for me was that I was never taught how to pass that guard. I didn't even know what he was doing to me. I just thought about where my weight was, where his weight was, how I needed to pass, all the principles that we learned mm -hmm. and, and kind of walk past his guard and, and, and from there it was, it was easy uh, as far as that goes. Yeah, that actually relates perfectly to the video I just... Uh that I guess that 
you have an editing right. Oh, that you just upload. Yeah, have to know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, have to know versus good to know. Yeah, right? and I think I, I watched a video. That guy was all good to know stuff. Yeah. Because once I got to once I got past his guard, he didn't know any of the basics. He couldn't escape cross side. He couldn't escape a case side. He couldn't couldn't stop anything. I mean, you know, I, I think I ended up collar choking him from mount. He couldn't. So it was it wasn't even like a struggle. Yeah. Um, I expected you know at that point I'm still like a one stripe blue belt maybe. He didn't have. What we consider, and I think more, what you know, anyone would consider in the Gracie lineage is basics. Yeah. Um, that you have to be able to defend yourself from every position and then worry about that fancy stuff at a later point. Yeah. And hey Mike, what kind of struggles can you think of that you've had in your journey so far? Uh, a lot of struggles I have is when you hit those points where you feel like it almost feels like you're regressing uh, and people around you are getting better. And uh, y'all hit windows like that where over a a three, four month period, I feel like my game's just not getting any better and everybody around me get around me is getting better. And uh, just realizing that you just have to stay motivated because it's just like the cycle of your development. That you'll get set in your ways or you're going to class and we happen to be working on the same things, the same fundamental things. And then all of a sudden you come to class like we had on Monday and uh, all of a sudden you say one thing or show me one thing and all of a sudden a light bulb clicks and you're like, oh, that totally changes this part of my game. But if you're not around for those opportunities, they're never going to happen. Biggest struggle is keeping that motivation to come back when you don't feel like your game's getting better. So now that you've got some, some students, some beginner students that you teach, and if they were to ask you, tell you that same thing's happening to them, what's your advice to them? Well, it's, it's to keep coming. And maybe it's, okay, you're good at this, then let's start playing a different part of your game. So your top game's good, okay, then let's just start start playing your bottom game more often. And things like that, which I struggle with as well, and you always have to remind me, is like, what are you doing on top? Get on bottom, sometimes. Yeah, because your, your wrestling background, your athleticism kind of always gives you the top position. Right. So now Ken... Um, also, as an instructor, I mean, what do you, let me ask you, what do you feel are some common issues you've come up against in teaching all these different people that you've taught? I think retention's always a problem for people. Like, you know, it's hard to retain uh, a lot of information, which is, which is why I like our, our style of teaching, because it is repetitive. You go back over the things. The thing that I tell people to kind of combat that is, is I have mantras in my head. It might be like, where are my arms or arms in or hips low or whatever it is, arms last, depending on, on what I'm doing. So I have these little cues. I have may, maybe I have two or three cues for a particular move. And there's a lot more to the move than that, but those are the, sort of the important cues to me that I have to nail down. And then, so I'll, I'll tell people to cue themselves because you get in this moment, you know, especially beginners, where they, like, like, I know I should be doing something, but I don't know what. I don't remember the instruction. I don't remember what I'm supposed to be doing. Or you're in this moment and, and, and things are moving faster than you want them to. And, and you can't kind of collect yourself. And I said, if you just cue yourself, if you your own your own little instructor in your own head, that you could say, oh, okay, I, I need to do this with my arm. And and if you give yourself a handful of those for each position or each move, suddenly you won't need those anymore. I no longer cue myself from you know getting my weight low or getting my hips down or getting my arms in. Like I never think to myself elbows in or arms in. It's so automatic for me um, when I roll to do certain things. Uh, other things are less automatic. Like there might be positions where I would lay flat and I needed to be tucked. So I need to cue myself, tuck myself up, right? Um, so I think a lot of it is realizing that, you know, listening to what the instruction is and give yourself a handful of cues that you kind of put in your own head and use those to, to keep yourself moving forward. What about for you, Mike? Um, it's different, a little bit different for me. But yeah, a lot of it are, are those where it's those key fundamentals like elbows in, right? Protect your elbows, uh, protect your elbows no matter what position right you got to protect your elbows you, you can't like what we were working on yesterday yeah. where we have students that are following with their arms and it's putting them in a bad position it's things like that it's always turning to the choke arm it's some of those fundamentals that anybody can learn and understand so when I was going through the basics with some individuals this last weekend and as you're going through the ladder it's it's things like that oh don't do that you always have to turn this way you shouldn't have to think about it always turn towards the shoulder that's choking you Things like that. Ken, why don't you give a quick um, description of what the ladder is? Because I've never mentioned the ladder in any video prior, um, but it's something that everybody in the school knows. Right. Uh, why don't you kind of give them a little overall quick breakdown on, on what it is and the concept behind it. All right. So the ladder is two parts. What we call the red part, which is the defensive part, and then the green part, 
which is the offensive part. And um, with our white belt um, curriculum, it's always based on, on the red ladder and you start from what's worst position ever and then seat belt and then side mount and there's variants on the side mount and then cross side and then um, full mount. So you go through that series um, until you get to being in somebody's guard, right? So being in someone's guard is still a red ladder position. You're not on the attack, you're on the defense. And then you turn that all on its side and then it's all the attacks from the other position where you're the top person in each one of those positions starting with someone being in my guard and working all the way to the point where you are you have somebody in the worst position ever. Yeah, or well, the best position ever. Yeah, well, yeah, you have somebody else in the worst position. Yeah, yeah. Um, now... One of the things that I make sure that, that we all do as instructors is we're all on the same page in teaching. We all teach the same way. You know, a lot of times what other schools will do is they have different teachers. They don't really have a set way they all teach. Yeah. I mean, everybody's got their own style. But as far as a curriculum, we all teach the same curriculum. So we could have uh, maybe a two-month white belt that is in my class at night. And he then shows up for your class on Wednesday, uh, Friday morning. And you can just ask him, okay, what do you know that's, so that's, far? That's my first question to anyone who I don't know where they are on the right. ladder. Where are you on the ladder? Right. What's the last thing you worked on? Yeah. Or what are you struggling with on the ladder? It's the very first thing I ask someone who's not just sort of a regular in my class. I immediately ask that question. Yeah. And then, Mike, you come across those too. Um, like I know with Josiah, who started showing up to, to your open mat classes. And I know that you'll train with him. And then he'll, he'll inevitably want to work on something. And, and you probably just... I don't know, what do you do when you work on something with him? Yeah, I mean, it's a lot of that. So it's either whenever I start out, it's usually do you have any questions, kind of what you do with us yeah. in class. And then if he does, we'll go over those uh, specific questions and address them. But typically it's when we're rolling and then seeing what he's doing or feeling what he's doing and then correct him as we're rolling. Yeah. And uh, and I, I think that's been really beneficial with some of this. So it is when I roll with you. And then you're like, oh, no, no, drop your hip or you know, do this or you, or you're not, you're not controlling, you know, this part of my body like you should be. Yeah. And it's all still within the confines of the ladder. Absolutely. Um, I, I want to go back to one of the earlier questions about struggles because as an older guy, I'm 45 now, going to turn 46 pretty soon. Started very you late. I am. I am. Older. <laughs> yeah, look at that. See, it's old. It's age. Look right? at that gray. Um, you know, so starting in my 40s, which is sort of not an easy thing to do. You know, to me, I, I had these aha moments along the way. So the first class I realized, you know, being on my back and have somebody mounted on me, I didn't know the first thing about fighting. I recognized in that sure. moment that when I had somebody mounted on top of me, that if this were a real fight, I was about to get my ass kicked because I could not simply deal with having another human being on you. And for anybody who's like an abject beginner that's not even been to a class, you have no concept what it's like to have another. If you've never been on your back and had somebody try and keep you down and you try and get up, you have no clue how difficult that really is. And, and that was the moment that made me join because I realized how little I knew. Yeah. And that I, it's something as simple as going to the ground, I was dead. And just not even, it wasn't even a well-trained guy. It wasn't like it was a, you know, some purple belt or you on top of me. It was another new white belt that was on top of me who didn't know much more than I did. And I recognized um, that I, I didn't have a chance in that situation. And, and that, was, that was my sort of real defining moment as far as, as joining jiu-jitsu. And then my little, I have these little ahas along the way. We, you know, we had a really big guy in our class who kind of started maybe a little bit before me and much bigger than me, biggest guy, smashed the daylights out of everybody. And I used to tap to his weight. He'd get on top of me and I would just tap to his pressure. He wouldn't have to do anything. I would just tap to him physically being on me. I could only deal with it for say 30 seconds, a minute, two minutes. And then I had it one day where he got on top of me and I might not have gotten out, but I literally didn't care who was on top of me. Like I didn't care about the pressure anymore. I realized the idea that pressure, like it didn't bother me. I had become acclimated to it. Yeah. And, and that was like, okay, now I can start doing jujitsu. Yeah. Because <laughs> it doesn't matter who's on top of me. Yeah. And that whole ladder concept, you're just repeatedly thrown into that yeah. situation. Oh, all we did was get smashed and smashed and like just being on bottom and bottom and yeah. bottom. I'm constantly on bottom. And you acclimate to it and you learn it and you learn all the movements and, you know, it's, you're not jumping around. Like, I, I, I would, you'd be struggling for so long if, if you were put in that sort of negative deficit position like this week and then three weeks later and then this, you never acclimate to it. You yeah. need, it's got to be repetition. Yeah, the other thing good about that is whenever they are working on their ladder, say they've been coming for a few months and you're like, where are you? Okay, we're going to do here. Okay, we'll start from worst position. 
practice it all the way up both sides left and right all the way up to there and then we'll add something yeah, yeah. so it's constantly starting from worst position all the way up yeah. left and right all the way up and then we'll add something do it again the next time add something like that uh, to make sure that they really understand that ladder and it should become second nature you know one of the values that i find in that teaching methodology is that all of you you know not only you but all the other members at any given level you all know what you're supposed to know at that point and so when you're teaching somebody you can always step in and just simply it, it becomes like a modular teacher process where it doesn't matter who's teaching you they can come in and teach you and I have that confidence that anybody that I send over to you guys, I know that they're not going to be taught something that is, is out of order. Um, it's because I know that's how you guys were all taught. Uh, but at the same time, I can feel confident that when I see you guys go up against somebody else, that I know what you're going to do. I mean, that's yeah. For me, that's the most important thing. I can look at you and know, okay, Ken's going to do this, Mike's going to do that. And it happens that way. You know, and I think a lot of people will argue with me about how you know, I'm not letting you guys express yourselves. That's but, crazy. Yeah. <laughs> right? Crazy. I think you have to get to a certain base yeah. that you have all the basics down in a, in a really proficient way. And I wouldn't say mastery because you're never going to master well, them. Well, it's a good fundamental, right? right. And, Everything and, and, then, and then you express Foundation. yourself. And even within that, you do. I have, I have you know, proclivities to go a certain way or do certain things. And to some degree, Mike, like Mike alluded to earlier, you have to overcome those things. One of the, sort of, one of the things I did early on as a white belt that, that kept me from progressing, I had those moments where other people were progressing around me, was I would lock people in cross side and I would just lock them down in cross side. And then when I was on bottom, people were moving on me. They'd go from cross side, they'd do them, they'd take my back. Like I had no concept of really how to take somebody's back from cross side because all I did was lock people down from cross side. So I had to give up that, that, that feeling of security, like I've got this guy, he can't move, I'll sub him from here um, to start moving and getting swept and moving and getting and losing and moving and losing and fun, suddenly now my game I never lock down anything for the most part I'm constantly trying to move I'll get to a certain thing that I might be working on I might go over that repeatedly tell me about it yeah I know so I do it for Mike all the time <laughs> I, I, I'm constantly moving on top of them and my goal is to get to find those tipping points where you're starting to escape something and I know the moment before you need to get where you get. So I start to move on that moment. And I can set up my next thing before you can come back because you want to do the inverse. You const I want, constantly want to be a half step ahead of the other guy. And, and when I was locking myself down, I, I couldn't get ahead of anyone. I didn't, like, I didn't even understand how to move. Yeah. That's how badly I was locking people down. Yeah, and both of you and then Zach who's sitting next to me, you, you guys all know that stuff, the transitions, because we spent so much time on the actual position itself. Yeah. Yeah. And you understand it as just a, a, a function of you're right. learning more. Right. It, it, it's just getting from position to position. Now, um, you know, one of the things I remember that got you to stop locking down on cross side was um, I'd always bring you in for a training dummy uh, for my privates. Whenever I, when I wanted to teach somebody how to escape the cross side, one of the people I'd bring in would be Ken because as he called it, he said, that's his wheelhouse. And one of the observations you made when you would come in and help me was that, oh, now, you're, now you're, everybody's learning how to get out of my cross side. And that's when you realize, I guess, maybe I should learn to do something else or yeah. get better at it, you know, yeah. on the next step. And, um, you know, Mike's got a very good cross side. I mean, we all have fits with it. Once it locks down, it's Yeah, I hate tough. Mikey's cross side. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, people still tap to it, unfortunately, for them. But, uh, I think a lot of questions from people who, who practically beg for you to tell them, how do I get out of cross side? Patreon! That, <laughs> that is... Uh, one of the biggest questions, like even just this week with students that transferred from other schools, yeah. right? You roll with them, they're like, how do I get out of cross side and how do I get out of mount? Yeah. They go, I, I just don't get it. I don't know what you guys are doing because you guys are escaping and they can't. They don't know what to do with their hands. They're just kind of lost. Invisible jujitsu. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah. Both of you guys have very good, uh, in fact, everybody here has got a very good cross side. Yeah, very um, much so. And if you, don't, if you don't have the key, you're not getting out. Um, at least not with any kind of major discomfort along the way. Um, are there any uh, last things you kind of want to mention? Uh, yeah, probably as an older guy dealing with injuries. I mean, I've never really got injured on the mat, but I've had injuries. I'm you know, not a young guy. I was point right knee surgery and wasn't like I heard of the jiu-jitsu, but after a while, you know, uh, you know meniscus starts to wear out. Um, and then other things along the way, you know, family and getting sick and stuff like that. So I've had periods where I've probably not been here as much as I need to be. And, and the, the secret is to kind of not lose focus on jujitsu, not to, 
um, to suddenly go, oh, I've missed two weeks, I've missed three weeks, I'm not in the mood to go back, that the first moment you have that you feel halfway decent, you should be on the mats. And the little tweaks here and there kind of take care of themselves, and you got to listen to your body and say, okay, I need a little break right now, but always come back to it. And I think I've had moments where I've had time off, unexpected long periods of time off. Let's say I didn't, I'd get sick, and then I had a business trip, and then I came back and I wasn't feeling well, so suddenly I was away from jujitsu for three weeks. And during that thing, I always thought, oh, I'll be back tomorrow. I'll be back tomorrow. I'll be back as soon as I'm back to my trip. And when I got back, it felt like I was off for three months. It was crazy. And then versus when I had my knee surgery, I knew exactly how long I would be out. And I never stopped thinking about jujitsu. And then when I came back, just by simply knowing I was out for this period of time, I'm going to constantly think about what I should be doing, what I would do. Um, when I came back, it was like I didn't miss a beat. And, and it was, I, that was a weird moment that I, I didn't realize was possible. That when you have time away from jujitsu, just keep thinking about jujitsu. And then when you come back, you're not going to take as big a step back as you would have otherwise. Yeah, and that's another good point uh, dealing with injuries that we have. I have a lot of people that have recently asked me about it. And they're like, oh, I got a bad shoulder. Well, can I still do jujitsu? Or I have this or I got to wear a knee brace. You know, is jujitsu too high impact for me? And one thing that Ryan's really good at and we're really good at is teaching you how to work around injuries. And, right. not, and not get injured in the Not first get place. injured, right? Yeah. So it's like not letting white belt drill run out of, out of the gate or doing this or the way we'll take an arm bar so that if you do fall, you're not breaking the other guy's arm. Things like yeah. that. And also teaching you, oh, well, if your shoulder hurts, okay, well, then you need to do things maybe slightly different here so you're not straining your shoulder. We go over some of those things as well. And, and yeah. jujitsu can be for anybody. We have uh, Dano. Is he 72? 72. 72-year-old man. That comes to class regularly and loves it. Yeah, and beginner. Just not, yeah, beginner. not 72 years old and has been doing jiu-jitsu for no. 30 years. 72 years old and it's brand new And jiu-jitsu. I think he came here at 70? 70. 70. Yeah. So he's been here like two yeah. years. So absolutely ab- abject loves it. beginner at 70 years absolutely old. Absolutely loves it. Yeah. We have all the way down to the youngins. Yeah. And you know, not and we don't we're not a full-time academy. We don't have people that are in the academy full-time. I mean uh, both Mike and Ken are among our busy, or oh, Zach are among our busiest members. Um, they're they're instructors as well, but um, you know they've got young kids that uh, that all have their own activities, mm-hmm. and it, it's not something a lot of people say. Well, you know, if I can't do three times a week, then it's not going to work out. And sometimes you guys do three days a week. Sometimes, no, there's sometimes two times I, I've done once in two weeks. I mean, yeah. I'm not happy about it. Work, you but, know, yeah. we're, all, we're all professionals. So we all have jobs. We're all working. We have multiple kids. But then, <laughs> Some of us more than others. Then when I'm available, like it's, <laughs> I was here, what, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, right? But then in two weeks, I might be here like one day. Right. Right. You know, but. So life gets in the way, but you just have to keep going. With yeah. your jiu-jitsu game and not, and not think that, oh, you know, I'm exhausted because I have kids and I have the kid activities. That's why we have later classes, right? And, and, you know, I want to touch on one more thing. Mikey, Mikey kind of had a good point about stalling along the way and watching other people get better than you. And Zach's a really good example, right? And then I had that moment early on where I'd see other people advance beyond me. Mm-hmm. And it'd, it'd be, it'd be like, oh, man, I suck. You know, I'm not good at this. I'm never going to get yep. better. Like even I remember when you gave me my blue belt, I didn't think I deserved it. Like, like, I really didn't think I deserved the blue belt. Um, I didn't either, by the way. But you I'm did. just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, but it, it was, now when I see people advance, um, it's more of an inspiration to me. Like, I use that as motivation. Because sometimes you get a moment and you think, well, I'm not going to get any better than this. Like, I can't picture myself being better at jiu-jitsu than I am right now. And then, and then, then, I, look back, then I look back at myself, you know, six months ago, a year ago, two years ago, and I realize well, you're an idiot. Of course you're going to get better. Right, and then rather than looking at people that are advancing, like, oh, I suck, they're doing this, I'm not doing this, it's more like, oh, that's possible, I can get there, I can do that. So it's a little bit of perspective, and I think that's a lesson for life. Your, your perspective on things kind of shapes um, your enjoyment of life. So change your perspective, look not at people who advance beyond you as negative for yourself, right. but as inspirational for yourself. Right. It's that thing where everybody's on their own journey, yeah. right? Some people can commit more, some less. Uh, some things click faster than others. It doesn't mean that your journey's stopping, right? Yeah. Everybody's on their own pace. Yeah, just be better than your, the you you were yesterday, you know I mean? Mm-hmm. That, that's all you gotta do. Yeah. You know, one thing too is uh, like with uh, the two of you, plus Zach and plus David, 
you guys are contemporaries. Yeah. And what's happening is you're all advancing all alongside each other. You're not, it's not as if one of you is outpacing the others. And if you are, it may be this month, but next month somebody else will outpace you. So when you're always training against each other and you're all doing the same things against each other and you're, you're, you're you know, equal pretty much, you don't see the fact that you're all as a group advancing. Yeah. Right. right. That, that's a yeah, good point. it's very hard to see. That's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. Because you're like, oh, I'm still having issues with Zach. I'm still having issues with Zach. So I mean, issues with Zach. <laughs> but Axe, you're both Zach's better. rising just as much as you are. Yeah. 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 Actually, that's, that's a good point. <laughs> <laughs> but that's another story. All right. So uh, let's kind of wrap this one up. I um, just wanted to kind of introduce you to to a couple of our instructors and. Uh, feel free to, to throw some questions in there if you have any, and when you do, then we'll try to get these guys to jump on and answer. And uh, in the meantime, happy training. <laughs>